Um, and that leads me to today's event. Um, so the theme of today's event is international engagement. And the reason we chose this event was for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, we have crowdsourced ideas from our community about particular themes that people feel would be helpful to explore. And this was one that emerged um, kind of at the top of the list. But also we are aware that we have a wealth of experience within the university um, that we really benefit from, from learning from. And um, so that's where today's panel comes in. And obviously against the backdrop of cuts to uh, foreign aid, um, to Brexit, to a range of um, you know, political issues um, in recent times, um, international engagement is a topic that I think is at the forefront of many of our minds. So the way today is going to happen is we will um, shortly turn over to the panel who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves. I've then got a number of questions that I'm going to put to them to respond to. We'll then open up to the floor and take questions from you in the audience. And we have Sam and also Alison today who are going to help monitor the chat uh, for your questions. We'll then take um, a short interval. Uh, and for those who wish to hang around, we're going to be running some speed networking for the last half hour, which I think will be um, a bit of fun. And we've got some conversation starters to, to help with that. But without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And um, I'm really delighted to have a panel made up of people from all four colleges today who have really kindly given up their time uh, today to share their experiences. So the first thing I would like to do is actually um, invite each uh, panelist to introduce themselves. So um, I'm just gonna see who's next, next to me on the screen. Um, Mia, could we start with, with you? Who are you and what sure. do you do? I'm Mia Perry. I'm based in the School of Education and um, my work is in literacies and arts and cultural practices. It relates to sustainability broadly. Perfect, thanks Mia. Um, next up on my screen, I've got Richard. Hi everybody, I'm a, a research fellow over in the School of Engineering, um, so in the College of Science and Engineering, and my main discipline is making sensors that we then use to see things underground and use them for applications like volcanology. Thanks Richard. Um, next up, could we have uh, Myrna please? Um, hello everybody, my name is Mirna Sholic and I'm a lecturer in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures and uh, also a member of Royal uh, Society of Edinburgh Young Academy of Scotland. Thank you. Thanks, Bruna. And uh, finally, Katie. Hi, I'm based in the Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine. I'm an ecologist by background and I study how this disease rabies is spread by domestic dogs and affects people. So I've got a lot of public health work that I'm involved in. Brilliant. Thanks, Katie. And thanks all of you for giving up your time today. So my first question is a very broad one. Um, I was just wondering if you could briefly give me a bit of a summary of your experience of working internationally. Um, so would anybody like to go first for that question? If not, I'll just choose somebody. I'm just gonna choose um, Richard, let's start with you. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, so I think I was lucky enough towards the end of my PhD, several moons ago to have a couple of fairly high profile publications. And I think that's left me in a nice position that most of my international engagement has, has come to me. <laughs> I've not had to do too much work, but I mean, it's, with work I'd be happy to do, but I've, I've had a lot of opportunities come my, my way. Um, so I suppose in, uh, we've got one main, main big project, which is a Horizon 2020 grant, where we're uh, making a new sensor network to monitor um, Mount Etna in Sicily, and that's with um, collaborators in, in France, uh, Italy, the Netherlands, Germany, and Switzerland, um, all working together down in, down in Sicily uh, when we can get there, which isn't very often at the moment. Um, I've also, so I suppose that, 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 that collaboration really resulted from a chance encounter at a conference, I suppose. So that was, that was just a, the, the um, highlighted the, um, the benefits of kind of arranging meetings when you go to conferences with people that might be interested in your work. I've also got a GCRF um, grant where, which is via a colleague in Belfast, but we're working with um, colleagues in Kenya, uh, Burkina Faso and, and South Africa to monitor 
water table levels um, for putting in water wells um, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, through that GCRF, GCRF grant, I've then met other collaborators, which we're now putting in an application for um, another grant, which uh, for working in Brazil um, with collaborators at, at Sao Paulo. Um, also working with a company in the Netherlands, um, in, in Amsterdam, um, that's sort of related to my, uh, the sort of fabrication processes with my, my normal work, but it's a slightly different application, working on atomic force microscopy. And I met them through, through some colleagues in engineering that, that knew my, my speciality. Uh, and then the most excited, exciting one, I think at the moment is um, a colleague that I met at a public engagement event several years ago, got in touch because she wants to make some sensors for um, monitoring pyroclastic density flows, you know, the things that wiped out Herculaneum and Pompeii, and to test them at a volcano simulator in New Zealand, where they actually, they can, they've got a fake volcano, they can kind of blast these pyroclastic density currents down the side of a mountain at 300 degrees um, for a few miles. So if that one, that, that's, that's in application phase, but if that one pulls off, that would be good fun. That's a kind of broad summary of, of my work internationally. Oh, yeah, thanks, Richard. A fake volcano sounds like a lot of fun. I hope that happens for you. Um, okay, um, Katie, could I hand over to you now? Yeah, sure. Well, um, since my PhD, I've been working on the disease rabies. And since rabies is a disease that is not found in, um, it's not found in high income countries, and I generally study it in domestic dogs, so it's almost always found in poor communities. By definition, to look at questions about rabies, I need to be working in countries outside of Scotland. <laughs> um, so I've been doing that for years now. And uh, during my PhD, I was based in Tanzania for a long time. Um, had to learn the language, try and make myself not stick out too much, which you can imagine <laughs> was not so easy. Um, and the, the methods that I was basically using was contact tracing uh, and also some genomic work. So very similar to concepts that people will be familiar with around COVID right now, as well as how to rapidly roll out and effectively reach populations through mass vaccination. Um, so these were all questions that were really important in communities that have major infectious disease problems, but not really a big consideration in the UK. Um, I would say that it was it was super challenging getting started, and it didn't help being a foreigner at all. Although that, that's not true, there was some there was undoubtedly privilege, many privileges to that. But I would say now over time that there are other collaborations that are super strong in other parts of the world that I think have been really nice because people have reached out to me. And so you kind of know from the beginning that it's kind of a much more potentially equitable or mutually beneficial partnership. Um, but that's that's much harder if you're a starting out PhD student when you kind of are not entirely clear if you can offer anything to partners in other parts of the world. So happy to talk about any of those aspects. Brilliant. Thank you, Katie. Um, Mirna, would you like to go next? Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. So I will just, you know, briefly uh, talk about my engagement. And if anybody has any question, please do ask uh, in the chat or directly afterwards, unmute yourselves. So uh, I'm currently a project, um, basically principal investigator of the of the RSE Royal Society of Edinburgh uh, project how to talk about migration, current academic research and migration studies and its relevance for school curriculum in Scotland and abroad, in which basically we are really trying to map uh, how children are taught about migrations in Scottish primary and secondary schools, and then compare this experience with how they are taught about this topic abroad. So basically this means that we'll be collaborating, not just with academics abroad, but also with teachers and we'll also have some uh, hopefully uh, pupils also contributing um, their works for our website because they would really like to you know what, know what children uh, think about this topic in comparative um, context which is now I think in particularly important because of Brexit the COVID-19 uh, situation and so on so it is really about knowledge exchange and also connecting with people uh, from outside of academia 
Uh, my other international projects are also linked to the theme of migration, especially in Central Europe and the Balkans, and these include media representations of migrants, as well as working with photographers and artists from that part of the world and then sharing experiences in the Scottish context, because we also always think that Scotland should learn something uh, from uh, other countries and vice versa. We are always into, I would say, exchanging experiences. Um, and well, that's about it. And I would also like to mention my interest in perhaps public engagement when it comes to uh, the conflict and post-conflict studies, me coming from the area of the Balkans. I think this is something very important for young researchers to be aware that it is not just that it is us who do and engage abroad, but it is also something about our identities because many of us do come from elsewhere and then we like to link different experiences, which are not just academic, but also personal as well. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Mirna. Um, and finally, could we come to Mia? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So, um, as I said, I'm committed to sustainability in research and teaching. So, my um, what I'm going to share today, today is sort of based on a contention that the partnerships and the relationships that we um, take up and work within determine the design and the implementation of the research and the teaching that we do. Um, but I also believe that the partnerships determine the outcomes and the impacts of it. And so uh, just a little bit of framing about what I'm going to say, because I realize that we're coming from very different positions in the university, um, that really my experience and colleagues' experiences of global partnerships can be summarized really as um, partnerships that serve very well those people who are, or those institutions already privileged at the expense often of those already disadvantages by injustices of power and economics and geopolitics and that kind of thing. Um, so that's a little bit of context to uh, what I thought I would share, um, which is that when I joined the University of Glasgow um, just over five years ago now, I came from working with a small international NGO. And so the U of G was keen for me to bring along my international network into our academic sphere. Um, so I started by supporting an academic mobility grant for Sub-Saharan Africa. And in that role, I traveled to Makerere University in Uganda. Um, so at that time, I was no more to people than a representative academic from the University of Glasgow, from the School of Education. And when I arrived as a staff member representing the University of Glasgow, I was shocked by the height of people's expectations of me. I was pedestaled really. Um, and this was back in 2016. And over the course of that visit, I accomplished, I think, two main things. And one of them was to stress and to clarify and to almost break the news to the staff and the administrators that I met at that trip that I didn't represent or have anything that they needed to address their professional challenges and goals. It was a bit of a bucket of cold water. There were high expectations and I think I was probably very disappointing in my presentations. I was not an authority for them. Um, as an individual, I didn't know more or have the capacity in things that they needed. Um, and I think that, that was one really important thing that I accomplished. And the second thing um, that I wanted to share that I think I accomplished was that I listened. I didn't, instead of focusing on the talks or standing up in front of rooms of people, making presentations or running workshops, we gathered in small groups and talked about our, most, uh, mostly I listened to people talk about their research hopes, their challenges and their priorities. And, and I'm sharing these two things because although at the time, these were actions and decisions that were totally improvised by me in response to the reception that I was given when I traveled to Kampala for the first time, um, coming from a career of working across contested cultural spaces in, from my perspective, from Canada, Ireland, Russia, Africa, the, um, these were also actions and decisions that I have repeated again and again and again in different ways and across different contexts ever since in my work in international engagement. So over the past five years, I have worked with colleagues, partners, collaborators to build a large active research network called Sustainable Futures. Um, I've led many projects with members of this network that spans sectors and disciplines and countries, communities and funders. And the common denominator of my work um, can be summarized by these two things. Um, one, that international engagement has to be based 
on equitable mutual exchange. In other words, I don't have the high ground in my partnerships. I don't have things to give. And I cannot only be taking or collaborating for my own benefit. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is the partnerships cannot happen unless we carefully and often laboriously figure out how to listen, how to relate and how to come to understand, as Myrna just said, other perspectives and positions. And I can't stress enough how incredibly difficult these two things are to accomplish, especially from the context of a large, powerful university like the University of Glasgow. That's it. Thanks so much, Mia. And if, if anyone's not aware of the Sustainable Futures um, project, well worth checking them out. Lots of really helpful resources around. I can find it and put it in the chat. That would be um, brilliant. Um, thanks so much. And again, um, yeah, really aware there's lots of um, different experiences in the room. Um, there's different groups being engaged here, whether it's communities or academic partnerships and uh, school teachers, pupils. Um, I imagine there's lots of different um, skills and, and kind of nuance uh, to the, the type, the, the way that you approach these, engaging these different groups. So um, I'd like to throw out um, a question which might tie into some of what Mia's already touched on. And that is, what challenges have you come up against in your international collaboration, whether it's with communities, whether it's with other academics, um, or whoever it is that you're engaging um, in other countries in these partnerships. Um, so would anybody like to take that question first? You can raise your hand and uh, unmute yourself. Or again, I might just pick on you. I think you'll have to pick, Zara. Okay, well, I, I might just come to you, Mia, because you started to kind of um, dip into that topic anyway, the, the challenges of engaging internationally, what are your thoughts? Okay, well, I'll say a couple of things, but only so to buy the others some time because I could probably go on and on and on about it. So I'll try, I think if I just pick one thing, um, I think one challenge is time. So I don't know everybody here in this room, but we're probably all time pressured and time pushed. Um, many people who work in international contexts are working in the context of a project, which is time delineated or urgently because we need something or have to accomplish something. And um, engagement and real ethical partnership and collaboration runs on a very, very different scale of time. And I think that those are two very uh, two things that we have to navigate very, very carefully, not to say that you need years and years and years to have an ethical partnership or a productive relationship. But if you only have a day, there's a certain amount that you can expect of yourself and of someone else. If you only have a year, then don't bullshit really you know you have a year you know you, there you know people are going to play very specific roles and hopefully you can make that a fair exchange but but really rich partnerships come and real real listening and understanding other perspectives comes over a lot longer than a project cycle and i think that that's sometimes quite difficult to navigate when we're in um the academic sphere great Thanks, Mia. Um, I'm just going to pick on somebody, and that person is going to be Katie, who I think you've just unmuted yourself. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I've just unmuted myself. I'm preparing myself. <laughs> um, well, I guess I, I'll follow on a little bit from what Mia said. I mean, communication is kind of a critical, I mean, it's a critical challenge in all aspects of collaborative working and academia, full stop, but it becomes even more so in international engagement because almost inevitably you're an outsider coming into someone else's some other people's space and you are not in a, a position to be able to navigate using your your sort of standard mode of operandum um and this is really challenging and i, I again sort of come back to what Mia was saying about how taking the time to build the relationships. And that's not something that happens overnight. I think you have to come in as well with the recognition that you're actually, at least in the in many of the places that I work, you're coming in as someone who has an incredible legacy of everything bad, <laughs> like everything bad. Um, so, 
there's really no reason why people would necessarily want to welcome you. Although inevitably people are lovely and welcoming. I mean, that's the best thing about my international engagement, I would say, is that the friendships and the relationships, the, par the partnerships that have been built. But you're coming from this backdrop. And I would say that to be honest, the university, I don't mean this specifically Glasgow, but I mean, we're part of it, but the academic structures do not, are not built to promote equity. Um, oftentimes, like the first things you're going in is to set up agreements that are protecting you as a scientist or your university without really any recognition <laughs> that the places that you actually potentially want to work in are the ones that have all the valuable things that need the protection of the vulnerable partners in this situation. And I guess, I mean, I don't know, this is going beyond engagement, but in the places where I work, I'm trying to address what we would think of as um, major, major health challenges, major societal challenges in places where I'm a foreigner. And the only people who are really gonna solve those challenges, it's not gonna be me, it's gonna be other people in those places. So in order to change the status quo, I need to be, my, my expertise that I can bring to the table, I need to be conferring that to other people who can lead and solve these problems. And the university and the academic structures are built in such a way that it's much harder to train people from overseas than it is to train them in your own institution. And it's just set up that way as the status quo. And I wanna change this rapidly. It's obviously not gonna change rapidly, but I do need to sort of change from the status quo. Okay. Thanks, Katie. I saw lots of heads nodding at that issue of equity and structure not being built for these equitable equitable partnerships and um, i think that's definitely a universal problem in higher education isn't it um who would like to come in next on, on challenges you've come up against mirna you've unmuted yeah i will just start uh, well thank you very much for me and katie uh, for sharing the experiences i can relate to many of them and maybe just as a humanities scholar, uh, I would like to mention that we always have to be careful because we are dealing with people's emotions. And sometimes it is really important, I think, when you go abroad, when you do sensitive topics such as migrations or such as conflict, post conflict uh, regions. Basically, it is always about explaining, but that happens in Britain as well, that if you are doing something like migration research, that doesn't mean that you are supporting migrations, illegal migrations, whatever, but you are basically just looking at how these topics are represented in media or you know, how nationalism is represented and so on. So it is always that I think we very we really have to be careful in highlighting that you know this is something that we research, but we are not taking, we are not you know reflecting our own opinions, what we think as private individuals about the topics that we are uh, researching. So I would say that is what uh, is really important. Well, um, I would also like to mention something about logistics of working abroad. Um, I spent two years in the Czech Republic on a grant uh, which was provided by the European Union. I was a young mother at that time and it took me, I think at least I spent four months trying to find a childcare for my you know, baby boy. And this is something that I think universities are not addressing uh, enough. Maybe now they're starting that many of us are also caregivers. We also have our lives. So when you go abroad to work, when you go to engage, even for a day, you have to sort out logistics. And this is a very, I think now, gender, you know, um, a based problem that many of my female colleagues feel the same, that you simply can't go without sorting out your life first in one way or another. So I wanted to stress this as well, along with uh, Katie's and uh, Mia's um, uh, points about uh, engagement. And also um, as a humanities scholar, many times we deal with media. So we are asked for interviews or we are like asked to make statements. This can again, uh, you know, be against you because then again you have to deal with comments from people who again think that you are expressing your private views, even though you are just talking about your research and leave your, you know, personal um, opinions aside. So I think this is also one of the issues uh, that we face. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for highlighting that. Um, 
yeah, really good points. Um, finally, can I come to Richard? Um, what challenges have you come up against? Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm guess I'm, I've actually not been sort of equity has seemed to be less of an issue. I think just the nature of the collaborations that we've had have been fairly symbiotic. For example, I've come in with an instrument and then you're working with geophysicists who have a kind of problem on the ground. So it kind of, it's, it's worked out quite well, but um, I think one of the main challenges, which I'm a fairly recent independent academic. So I've kind of come in, had the Horizon 2020 grant and the GCRF grant, and now half of these things are now disappearing. Um, so the government's clearly making less of a focus on international development. Um, and, and, and funding to sort of fund that sort of stuff, you know, the flagship being GCRF being canned, um, which, you know, we've got under to the radar for this one project. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's even, there's other sort of less visible challenges in terms of funding, you know, things like not having European PhD students that used to be, you know, as uh, almost the same as sort of a UK student in terms of being able to, to fund them, but now a U European PhD student would count as exactly the same as a an international student, so there's very few places for them to study. And I think through those sort of, um, you know, the travel of students, I think is a great way to form connections with other researchers around about, about Europe in, in, in this case, and, and, you know, connections with their former, um, you know, sort of supervisors of master's projects or whatever. Um, so it's a challenge. I mean, I don't know what to, how, to, how to solve that. I don't know whether if there's less funding around, you know, the benefits of the, the pandemic and kind of everybody becoming aware of how useful Zoom is. I mean, that's clearly less travel is cheaper and it's also going to be better for the environment. And the, the ethics of uh, excessive travel is something that I'm also struggling with <laughs> and trying to find ways around that. But that's that's perhaps a separate question. And that's an interesting kind of follow up question to explore. Maybe how has the pandemic affected all of you as you know researchers working internationally? I can add uh, a couple of things on that. Um, because I've been very engaged in various COVID response work in a few countries, but only one of which is where I had a long-standing collaboration, and two others were through sort of colleagues or colleagues in the institute, and another one through an old collaborator who was running the UN response uh, in Bangladesh, and it's been exhausting. <laughs> I mean, absolutely exhausting and really challenging. But what I have been shocked about really is that if I had, have, if you'd have told me that I'd have made kind of friendships with people on different time zones and in a country where I, I don't know the culture, I don't, I'm not familiar, yet I feel like I've got a very strong bond with a number of people who we, kind of interacted very closely in in like times of crisis with and I was I mean I was struggling because I was like homeschooling and trying to do other stuff but I was not struggling compared to the situation that my colleagues were in but I was just I was really amazed at the ability to be able to form these relationships which I I mean I hope sometime down the line they'll actually be we'll actually get the chance to meet face to face and maybe take forward some of these things in avenues that are not immediately so driven by a crisis but um yeah it's just it's really kind of shown me what is possible to do via zoom that I wouldn't have anticipated and maybe you know the the nature of the pandemic has forced this upon us all but I would also say that collaborations that I had on before the pandemic in it, kind of long-standing collaborations, I've been very happy, essentially, at, really at my redundancy. <laughs> They've been able to lead work that is, I'm really happy with. And I'm just, you know, providing a bit of advice here and there. And so that has been, uh, I think, really, re really important. And I'm quite excited about the, the public engagement now that is being led by Kennedy, a PhD student of mine from Tanzania, who we're, we're going to try and see what he can do in terms of shooting some footage in his local communities, but with some guidance from sort of filmmakers and, and so on who are here and just seeing like how much knowledge transfer can go on that way and just, just see how we can be innovative given the circumstances and kind of make sure that that he's able to get what he needs 
from us and produce something that he feels real ownership over. Thanks, Katie. Definitely a couple of positives definitely that have, that have come from all of this. Um, would anyone else like to respond to that impact of the pandemic? Oh, yeah, well, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary, you go first. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll be short. Uh, well, uh, we are just currently, I think it was quite positive and we had very, I would say, unexpected, unexpected developments because we were supposed to run the project about migrations in schools, so a physical environment with free workshops on the campus, invite our colleagues from abroad and so on. And that all, of course, failed because of the COVID. And then we had to revise the entire budget and we realized that the budget which was aimed at bringing people over and paying for their plane tickets and accommodation can be now used towards outputs because everything is online. And so now and when it comes to that, I, we found out that this is brilliant because now, for instance, we have money to run a virtual exhibition about the Polish migration in the Kelvin Grow uh, Museum and Hunterian Gallery. Uh, we can also pay uh, artists to co and commission their work, which will then published online on our website, and then again can be promoted abroad. So, in terms of outputs, I think it is brilliant. And also, um, just like Katie said, I had an opportunity to meet brilliant people just by talking via Zoom and also engage uh, with. Um, the colleagues who I didn't work with earlier simply because I did not have these financial issues of bringing them over and discussing things with them, but having them face to face even via Zoom and then deciding on what we are going to do. So I think in terms of outputs and engagement, Zoom and the virtual reality can work just fine. That sounds great. You'll need to keep us posted on the virtual exhibition. We'll look out for that. Thank you. Okay. Mia, would you like to come in? Yeah, um, a, a little bit, uh, a little bit counter, just to balance. Um, I think that um, one, there are two phases of what's happened since uh, the pandemic in the work that I do internationally, and one of them is a very quick and almost embarrassing realization of the digital divide as it permeated through ac even academic collaborations. I'm not even talking about rural communities or, or young people, um, but the number of people across my teams that suddenly disappeared from work because they had to leave their offices and they didn't have devices to take home and work in their rooms or to share amongst their own families. So I think that that was a really quite a embarrassing realization for many of us that actually we've been working on this understanding that we had digital um, engagement and equity, but only half of us could keep working. And so it took us about six to eight months to re-align um, resources. And actually a, a silver lining is that we've been able to justify things like digital resources in a way that was always very difficult previously through funding. Um, so I think that's the first thing that happened. We, you know, we, the digital divide is real and it really impacts international collaborations and engagement. Um, and the second thing is to do with when we are digitally engaged. And this is to do with research, teaching and learning um, and partnership building, I think across all contexts is that to remember for people like us in the UK that have relatively stable broadband touch wood um, and devices that we can take at home, take home and everything to remember that it still doesn't equate to um, an even experience of all people um, and it makes a huge difference if you have to zoom only on your phone and you have to stand in the hallway to do it or if you're paying five pounds every five minutes for data to use and you have to turn on your camera because you're being guilted into all these sorts of things there is no equity and i think that it's very difficult for people to even for me and i've been in these different places and worked with these different people um, it's very difficult to remember that this is not an even playing field and going to be being together in, in a room with someone isn't either but it's there is an effective capacity that we have to mediate that space that we don't have when we're just relying on on zoom and video conferencing and i think that that's become really clear for a lot of our my colleagues in education as they've been working with international partners to deliver education digitally um it's a whole different board game and it's um not it's it's um it's new uh, new issues of inequity and disparities in access, despite the fact that you might see them online. So that's just the counterbalance. I, I mean, I'm with Katie and Myrna on lots of the positives as well. And, you know, being here and being able to stay in my bedroom and go on to something else in half an hour is great, but um, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, really good um, point about the digital divide. And it, it's been a learning curve for myself as well, 
you're running training and things online and you just assume that everyone's accessing your training using a laptop but of course some people are on their phone and if you're sharing, sharing powerpoint slides that's completely useless people can't see it so um yeah a lot to learn um any other responses richard just very briefly i mean i think um yeah clearly there's huge advantages to zoom but there's been there's difficulties too i mean i think for for example my uh, a new phd student that's working with me it's it's very well for for slightly more senior researchers that have got existing networks you can kind of you can get the meetings and you can get the deliverables done and it's well i suppose it's also easy to devalue the the fact that it's it's perhaps just less enjoyable to to meet people in zoom i mean there's there's a lot of sort of social benefits to being able to meet people and kind of share a meal and i think you get you know these informal conversations are I've never quite found an efficient way of having those online in as productive a way as you can in person but but certainly for for say a new PhD student, it's very difficult to to make these these sort of new connections. Um, if if you're just starting, for example, um, yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> it it really is, and and I know there's a number of um, attempts to try and recreate those kind of informal situations where you meet people. One will be happening later in this session. If you if you're still around at half three, we're going to try some speed networking on Zoom. But of course, we technology is never going to be um, the same as face-to-face. As -face. Okay, um, moving on to the next question, which again is very open. Um, and really that is, what, what are the benefits of working internationally for you as a researcher? Okay, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think, that I've been to places and I've met amazing people and I've got loads of fun stories, which I think is just, is a part of the nature of field work, whether it's overseas or not overseas. Um, but in that sense, it's just can be super fun and bring you all these insights and perspectives that um, are kind of important in your own life, in your own, research your science and so on. So I just, it just is the ability to experience things outside of your own little box, which has been really, really beneficial. Um, and I said before that the friendships and the partnerships are kind of what makes it work. I mean, that's not, that's not specific to international stuff, but many of my, much of my work is, and I would place that at the, the heart of what I enjoy about what I do. Um, yeah. Oh, go sorry. ahead, Mary. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Mia, again, me. Um, it's a very difficult and interesting question, and Zara, thank you very much for asking this. I don't know if you have ever thought about this, you know, uh, earlier when we engage in international research, but I would again like to point out that uh, it is really ma it really matters who researchers are, and when I just think about myself. I changed so many countries. I was born in Yugoslavia, which fell apart. Then Croatia came into existence. I moved to Canada to do my PhD, came to Glasgow. And I think as a researcher, I just could not imagine that I'll be just sitting in Scotland in the library um, researching books. I think all of us who are multilingual and who traveled around, we need we have this link with the so-called, you know, abroad with the countries uh, outside of Scotland. And I think this is extremely important because you can always bring fresh perspective and you can always look at social issues in Scotland from the point of view of the similar issues in other countries. So for instance, uh, you know, when I do anything about migrations along the so-called Balkan route, I learn from the experience of those people who work with those migrants and then I can basically go back to Scotland and advise, you know, how these things are done elsewhere. But I think the position of the researcher, who the researcher is, is what matters as well a lot in international work. I was just kind of, shall I jump in? Oh, sorry, go for it. Very yeah. quickly, um, that uh, I think it's something that, uh, to do with um, 
ridding yourself of a sort of myopic view and um, whether you come from lots of different places in the world or whether you've only ever lived in Scotland, everything that anybody does is connected to the rest of the world. We're in a globalized world. And I just think it's our responsibility to make sure that we're aware of how our practices impact people who are in um, often very much less stable uh, contexts across the world because you can't deny that they're connected so let's make sure that we have our eyes open to them and the best way to do that is to work with people um, so for me it's just about making sure that your work is relevant in a very globalized world I think I'd add to what Mia says I agree completely I mean it's I think there's a sort of responsibility or an obligation to try and at least with with knowledge to kind of break down borders to share information as, as much as possible um, and I think the from a selfish selfish perspective I think the funding agencies still value knowledge exchange and 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 the impact that you can demonstrate by having these collaborations even if the uh, the government perhaps don't not that I'm biased towards the government or anything thanks Richard um, I've got one more question before we're going to open up to the floor um, and that's really, what advice can you offer to other researchers who um, are thinking of engaging internationally with their work? Any words of wisdom? Personally, I'd say sort of jump at those opportunities that you get to, you know, if you're going to a conference, it's well worth emailing people in advance and arranging a coffee for, for 10 minutes when you're there, because you never know what will come of these, these conversations and the opportunity to be with uh, lots of different people from around the world at the same time is, is very valuable. So it's worth making the most of. I've certainly had collaborations that have been very fruitful that have, have come from those quick chats. I think my advice for the moment is just to, um, uh, to get used to or get a bit comfortable with not knowing what you're doing I think we're if you're in if you're here in academia you're probably here because you're really really good at something <laughs> you probably have lots of very specialized knowledge and you um, probably are very practiced at going in on your strongest step on your strongest foot and giving what you know best and I think partnerships often succeed because people are okay that actually um, as Gabriella said in the chat like if I wasn't comfortable not understanding a word that was going on around me I would be very uncomfortable in international partnerships and I think that that's something that academics need to work at, getting getting comfortable with knowing that they don't know everything. So if you're in a room of people who are from different places with different languages and different knowledges, getting comfortable with saying, I, you know, listening again, back to what I said at the beginning, getting good at listening and knowing that you only know a piece and that to make that piece of any relevance anywhere else, you can need to be open about the fact that you need partners and that there are people in there that know things that you don't know. Um, it might sound a little bit abstract, but I think it's something we're not very good at. Um, I would just say very briefly, uh, I totally agree with Mia that listening is very important. And especially, you know, when you go abroad and when you listen to people, when you speak in English, then I'm always aware of it's non non-native non speaker that maybe something I say is not really in a certain way in which the native speaker of English would say, and it leads to a lot of problems in communication. So I think it is quite um, important really to listen and to find out about different perspectives and you know where these people are coming from and also perhaps you know which theoretical frameworks and uh, they use because we all come also from different academic traditions and this sometimes sometimes a uh, clash, especially in humanities. So importance of listening perhaps can't be uh, stressed enough. Yeah, to be honest, I don't really have anything additional to say, but I would also stress being, yeah, the, the importance of listening and also actually being prepared to admit that you actually don't know the answers and that actually you should be before you go in and jump ahead with with your expertise you first need to consider the fact that people in the area are working actually really live the thing that you might be studying i think just to add to that i think i've had to call, call recently with a with a company and they were interested um 
in some work that we were doing. It turns out our work would be completely useless for what they they do. But I think being upfront about that rather than trying to sort of, um, you know, fake your way through it and pretend that you can be the solution to all of their problems. I think it's worthwhile being upfront, having an honest conversation, and they'll probably come back to you in the future with a different problem that relates more to your work or, you know, where you can work together in the future, kind of forming that, that bond. And maybe if I can also add, sorry, Zara, whenever we go abroad, we also go, you know, with our own prejudices and stereotypes about places and people. And then once you are there, when you start talking to the actual people, then I think your opinions change as well. And this is what matters. Just to, you know, be self-reflective and to think about the prejudices that we all have. So this is, I think, the role of researcher always to go against them and also to question um, ourselves as well. Absolutely, loads of really useful advice there. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, at this point, um, we have time for questions from the audience. So I'm gonna ask uh, Sam and Alison if anything has come in on the chat. If you haven't asked a question yet, feel free to type one in or you can unmute yourself if you prefer. Well, we have had one question in from Gabriella who was <clears throat> highlighting the communications barriers that exist when you have different cultures involved in your activity. And uh, she cited an incident where she was um, part of an international workshop and the um, attendees and students were fearful to engage because they felt it was their English that was going to be judged, not perhaps the comments and um, context of their uh, statements. Thanks for sharing that, um, Gabriella. Is that something that resonates with anyone on the panel? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think language is huge and we don't do nearly enough in, um, in research to account for the role of language, the role of translation, the role of uh, second language use. Um, and I don't, there's no quick answer to it, but I guess it would be great if everybody here um, if attention was was raised and you and as soon as you start having conversations with um, speakers of other languages, you start breaking down even that word partnership means we, we've done a little bit of work on translating partnership into the native languages that we work in. It means entirely different things. And if you're using an English version of it, you're not really sure what the meaning is that's being shared. If it's being translated as you go, it's being translated with different connotations and implications. And that's just a small example. Um, it's just really it's just a really big factor that should be a really substantive thing that you're working with as international collaborators um, and making sure that you're not assuming that the meaning conveyed through English is that some kind of universal meaning. <laughs> it's just one version of reality and we need to be careful to unpack that as we go. That's great. I've, I've noticed another um, question came in saying um, it would be great to hear more about Brexit and how this is impacting researchers in Scotland. Has anyone got any thoughts on that? Mia? No, you go, Marta. You'll know more. Um, well, just a quick one. I think we are still waiting to see how Brexit will impact us, but what we can feel, and this has been going on for a long time, is now the cancellation of the Erasmus scheme which is not only detrimental for students, but also for staff. I used to go to Erasmus Mobility and it was fantastic, but now I do not have you know, such a chance any longer, which I think it's a shame. But I think you know, we'll see the impact of Brexit uh, in the next year or so, because maybe many of us are not even aware that this is happening because we didn't have a chance to travel, but I think it will hit us very soon. I think um, just to add, add a little bit, um, it's really just demoralizing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, um, I, I guess I have more international collaborators than local <laughs> collaborators. And I think it just, the statement that goes out about the degree to which we care about <laughs> working with other people from different backgrounds from different countries it's just um it's just the worst possible message and i think the people who are directly affected by brexit i mean it's just shocking the ramifications into people's lives i think it's very easy to sort of be a bit insular and ignore it 
but I mean, it's just, it's just a massive impact in people's lives and it's so insular and it doesn't project for all the, for all the talk about world leading and so on, we're projecting an image that is the exact opposite. So I'm just a bit disappointed <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, it doesn't affect me the way it affects others relatively, but I, I am just really sad. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm sure yeah, lots of people feel the same way. Um, I noticed somebody in the chat, EH, would like to ask a question. Do you want to unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat, whichever you prefer? Yes, hello. This is me, Ezra Hussain. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Glasgow. Uh, thank you so much, Zara, for organizing this panel discussion. It's been really great uh, listening to you and learning. And uh, yeah. Uh, learning more about this opportunity. While listening to all four of you and uh, trying to reflect on your answers, I could help myself but wonder about what about like students or researchers who are not Europeans and students of color. Um, I'm thinking of maybe a presentation and I'm thinking also of myself. What if I want to do something similar to, to the things that you do? I find it really admirable and uh, it does align with my vision and my research. And I'm just wondering, how will it be for a person like me to navigate that space and to go into international impact? Um, if you have any thoughts on that or uh, any, uh, yeah, any thoughts in general. Thank you so much. Do you mean to start to forge new international partnerships and collaborations as a PhD student, Ezra? Is that what, is that your question? How, how to do that in from the position of a PhD student at the University of Glasgow? As a researcher. Uh, yeah, as researchers in general, not just PhD, PGRs in general. Uh, so how can we get into this field and then how can we navigate this space if we don't have European citizenship and if we're not British or Scottish, uh, basically non-EU international uh, researcher. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think that um, you absolutely should and you must and there w there should be very few barriers and I think one of the silver linings of this terrible last 18 months is um, some of, you know, we unfortunately before the pandemic, a lot of the international travel was carried out by PIs and, and senior researchers that had the budget to get on the planes all the time and go and present the work. And often the, res the early career or the research assistants or the PhD students were restricted in that. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that there are no restrictions anymore to um, putting yourself in positions of networking th that are digital and maybe not as um, uh, fulfilling, but they are still there. And I think that that's something that you should just jump at the opportunity. So, uh, you know, anyone that you're working with, your supervision team, um, researchers that you know, if you can find ways to get into symposia, presentations, conferences, um, doctoral, um, special interest groups in professional organizations, all those sorts of things. In some ways, that's there's a there's a window opportunity right now that you should definitely take up. Um, in terms of, and the other advantage that you have is if you're already doing this, then you are starting young. <laughs> you know, like you you you're building relationships that will that you will carry with you for twenty years. And if you start working with especially other early career researchers in other places, the chances are you're going to have really rich partnerships as you navigate early career PhD and move into research in common areas of interest and and specialization. So I would say take advantage of the digital networking opportunities, but also make sure you are using the University of Glasgow context to the best of your ability right now, just ask your supervisors, say, who do you know, I, you know, where can I go? Who can I be put in touch with? Um, and I think, to, and I'll just say one more thing, make sure that your supervisors or the pr professional support you can get while you're here is equipping you when you're finished to go into the context that you want to go into when you're finished. Because if you're not, the system of the University of Glasgow will prepare you to be a University of Glasgow academic, which is a very particular type of academic. And the academic career at Glasgow is very different from an academic career in an African country or in a Caribbean country. So think forward, where do you want to be in five years and make sure that you're starting to find those skill development opportunities now. Um, because they won't necessarily be handed to you. 
um, just again, the system that we work in. Thanks, Mia. Does anyone else have a comment on that question? I'll add something. I'm not quite sure if it, it helps, but it, it might speak to some people. Um, so for example, in the work that I do, I work, you know, I'm always on Zoom to colleagues in other places. And so the students that I have who are based here um, are kind of forced to work with, with my collaborators or, or I really want them to. But I think the biggest thing, especially, which has been even more challenging because of the way that we've been so insulated from others over the last 18 months. But the biggest thing is confidence to actually start to build that direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with these people that you might be introduced to, but then you've had the introduction, but you know, where do you go from there? And it's like your, your advisors, your colleagues can do can help with introductions, but ultimately it only becomes productive if you are willing to dive in to the next steps and sort of take that ownership. And actually, I think as, as people said earlier, being able to prepare to, to admit there's gonna be lots of stuff that you don't know, but to, to start building that conversation and, at the moment, you know, everyone is super stressed and super busy and they won't probably be in the position to help you build that relationship as much as maybe under ordinary circumstances. But it, it, essentially, if you have the opportunity there, you just want to try and build on it as, as much as you can and just have that conversation. I think it was said earlier that the the people and the relationships that you form now, you'll be surprised how they come into play further down the line. Um, I would also say that many funders, uh, at least those that I know of, there is usually a requirement that if we, as let's say more senior members of staff are applying for any funding, then we are always encouraged or required to also take ECRs on board, which means PhD students or young postdocs, so people who are at the start of their career. And I think this is actually great, and this is what I really appreciate about the funders, because I think that young people should be given an opportunity. And um, this is what I think you should also talk to your supervisors or with your school uh, and for instance, the virtual exhibition, which I mentioned, will be done entirely by our research assistant, who's our PhD student. And it will be great to showcase the work you know, in the Canterian Gallery abroad. But I think for her, it will be also great simply you know, to have this in the promotion and perhaps uh, you know, visibility in um, countries other than Scotland, just by using the, the media of the virtual uh, exhibition. I also must say that uh, in, in Britain, you know, the culture of supporting young people People is great. Uh, I remember myself going to some Central European countries as a PhD student to conferences. Nobody took me seriously because just, they, they, they just looked at me as being a student who is not even worth listening. So nobody would come and show up, you know, for your panel. But I think even if this happens to you, you shouldn't be discouraged because it says nothing about you, but it says about people who really don't want to hear about the new research done by you know, young um, uh, uh, scholars who are, I think, as good as some older colleagues, in my opinion. You're the new hope. You're the new hope. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah, I'm just going to say, um, I certainly can't speak from uh, personal experience about the challenges facing um, a person of colour, I mean, clearly I'm from a, a sort of privileged background, but um, for all from lots of different characteristics of, of privilege, but um, just to add to some of the stuff that that, that uh, Mina and, and Katie said, I mean, I think it's, it certainly should be part of the role of your supervisor to help make, help you make those um, uh, connections, but I know it's sadly not, not always the case that they will, but I think hopefully it's your supervisors or, or collaborators that you sort of, that are within your group, um, would be pleased if you sort of took the initiative and asked to be, um, you know, to, to be included in some of these calls because you would like to, you know, you would like to make these connections. And I think if you, you know, sometimes you have to put yourself out there and ask. And then, then once once you're in that situation, as as others have said, you can try and make the most of most of those situations. 
Uh, can I also add, sorry, Zara, uh, what I find really useful, especially for my PhD students, is the use of media. For instance, promoting yourself on Twitter. I found I met so many wonderful people just by tweeting about different things which are related to my research, or maybe submitting a piece for the conversation, uh, which is again a journal run by academics for academics, non academic uh, audience, which is absolutely brilliant. And this is again how you engage with the audience, people will write to you, you will answer questions and so on. But, uh, you know, and this is all I think can be done with the help or even without help of your supervisors. But I think it is really about promoting yourself and, you know, telling us and the world what is good about the things you do. And I think there are many other, perhaps wonderful things that you are doing. Thanks, Myrna. Um, I've noticed we've got a hand up from Yulia. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, hello. Sorry, my internet connection is so bad. I hope I will be able to ask a question. Thank you so much for uh, your um, presentations and answering questions. I um, have a question to the women on the panel. Um, when you work with partners in some countries, there is a very strong hierarchy, hierarchy of gender. Um, and I, I, I joined Glasgow last year and started quite a few projects with partners in some countries where I'm a PI or I'm co-leading from the Glasgow side. And I realized that there was a huge uh, gender imbalance and you know, age is an issue of course, but me being a woman and the other people being men and being professors. So this academic hierarchy and me being a research fellow at Glasgow, I never had this. I've been working with UNESCO for a long time and I, was just accepted as an expert who was, you know, leading particular uh, projects or parts of projects. And I never had this sort of academic and gender hierarchy there. So for me, navigating it has been a real challenge this past year. So if you have any advice of how you've done it in, in your career, it would be really helpful. Thank you. That's a huge question. I mean, it depends on what part of your career and in which, which context. I think um, uh, I think I only really claimed feminism when I was pumping milk in a conference bathroom <laughs> in my <laughs> early 20s. Before then, I thought I was fine. Um, but I would just say much more recently, and Yulia probably connected to your experiences in the past couple of years here. Um, the, the thing that I would say about the hierarchies in other institutions and in other parts of the world um, would be to work that it's our responsibility to work really hard to um, to have a, a practice of equity and diversity in how we um, collaborate actually because there'll be a certain amount of privilege that you'll be given simply because you're coming from the University of Glasgow but it, if you're not careful like so many other things if you're not careful you'll end up with teams surrounded by senior male professors in um, a you know, in other universities. And it actually takes another layer of work to make sure that you are also actively seeking um, the voices and the input of people from different communities within your, the academic community or the community that you're looking to partner with. So in a way, I would say, this is only one part of a much bigger question, um, that there's a lot of work we can do to make, to be the change, I suppose, to be the change because of the positions that we're we're in that we're entering into these partnerships in and it's hard to do that but I think that that's one thing to think about. I totally agree and it's kind of it's really really hard and for the most part you kind of have to model what you want to see because there's often not always the model, the model that you want to see does not necessarily exist. I would, I'd also, I mean, this is quite a difficult thing to say as well, but as a, as a young academic, particularly if you're female, but it doesn't have to be the, the, the case, going out into a different place, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be overseas, but you may be subject to risks as well. I mean, I, I would say that as a, in my 20s, I became completely hardened to awful attitudes to me and to practices the way that the way that certain men would would treat 
me. And it was only when, when working with other, when working with other men who saw this happening to me, that they actually were like, what, does this happen all the time? Like, they're shocked at this. But it, I, I really became hardened to it in my 20s. And then I think, um, I think I have come out the other side and now I'm sensitized to it. But it's, it's a super challenge that is, I don't think we, don't think we really have answers. It's a problem with our society, but we have to be, we have to work in ways that can help to address that and call, call things out, but also take care of ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a very good, I know Julia, where you are coming from, because I had these experiences working in countries where you have, you know, th th this um, basically very traditional uh, um, hierarchy in the universities when you know who is professor and who is lecturer, and especially that goes with, you know, established male professors. I think this is a good exercise in imposing your voice. And what I see with many women, especially those from Central and East Europe, they don't do that. They are basically scared to voice, uh, you know, what they are good at and what they can do. So I think you really have to take it in very, very, very small steps and really always, you know, keep focusing on asserting your voice and also of uh, knowing what your self-worth is, because this is something very difficult, I think, to um, uh, get in these environments. Uh, I actually just also remembered something uh, um, um, which I would like to mention uh, during, well, when Katie said that sometimes, you know, we are also in danger when we go abroad. What happened to me was that my son was racially abused in public transportation because he's a mixed race. And uh, I was, of course, you know, shocked, but I took this uh, issue with the university who issued a statement of my behalf saying that racism won't be tolerated, especially because this particular university was trying to bring international members of staff. So they were very scared for their reputation. And I think it is really always uh, you know, good to make something uh, that bothers you known. It is always good you know, to come from the position where you will say, sorry guys, now I'm here, I'm working with you and I really need you know, respect and also need acknowledgement, which I uh, deserve. So it is really an exercise in asserting yourself and in also in knowing uh, what you are good at and which expertise uh, you bring, but it's a long-term process and a very difficult one. Thanks for sharing that, Mirna. And thanks to all of you for being so candid around that. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's any more questions. Um, but while we wait, just a question from me. It, it sounds like um, a number of you have sustained um, collaborations or relationships abroad for, for quite a number of years. So I was wondering how you managed to maintain a relationship in that way when they're so far away. Any tips for sustaining relationships? Friendship, that's all I'll say. It's about friendship. Develop your skills at getting money. <laughs> okay, okay, that too. <laughs> the friendship helps when the money doesn't come. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I don't know. I feel like I spend more time trying to find money than I do trying to do science. And it's, I, I, I was not aware of this when I started out on my academic career. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would also say for international engagement, the longer the relationship, the deeper the relationship. I mean, you know, we can do things now that would not have been possible a few years ago. So whilst it's super hard, I would say um, to getting the money to, to keep long-standing relationships is, is also how you can, you can build trust and I think, you know, one thing that I can try and do now is convey to the university, to funders and so on, what is the value of these long-term relationships? Because I think if they're not, and this is exactly the kind of issue that is being totally destroyed by GCRF and sort of acknowledging that how sort of the, 
the current situation is breaking trust that has been built over many years and it's not something that happens overnight. I think that's something that is really not well well enough recognized in um, necessarily in, in funding or the, the government policy decisions and so on. But the long term, the long standing relationships is is really, really crucial. Can I just say one thing just in response to that, Katie, and then I'll kind of to Marina is I do agree that there's a lot like money does a lot because it allows you to get on a plane and get to know people in a different way. But I think I don't you know, I think that it's the amount of money is very discipline specific and it actually doesn't cost very much money to have a partnership and to have a friendship and a long term collaboration. And I think that it's an open question. It's not something that's well seasoned conversation or anything, but I think we really need to be careful um, about the relationship between partnerships and finances, because actually money, you know, I could have used money instead of time as one of my answers to your first questions are, what's the challenge of partnership? Well, money is the great divider, you know, because money doesn't mean the same thing in every place and it causes a huge amounts of complexity and distrust and problems and inequity. So I just think that, yes, I don't want to discount the role of money, but um, friendships and long-term partnerships shouldn't need money because money means different things to different people at different times so i just want to add that counterpoint katie um but some research is cheap and some is expensive i recognize you probably your, your research probably is very expensive <laughs> thanks nia uh, i will just add yes money but as mia say definitely friendships which means again staying in touch. I use a lot of social networks to stay in touch with my uh, colleagues and collaborators who are now also friends, doing small favors for one another. For instance, I work with many photographers. Uh, I get their monographs uh, because, simply because I provide feedback on the written text, so on the written part of these works. And this means a lot to them because then they get different perspective, maybe from a little scholarly point of view, but still something which is very uh, worth. So it's not all about money. It is really about being there when somebody needs you in any possible way, providing feedback, uh, helping with, you know, some maybe other logistical issues or, you know, basically just talking and, uh, um, yeah, staying in touch. I'd, I'd agree with all of that. I mean, I think um, one thing I'd add is, is perhaps uh, logistics and having a good plan for sort of maintaining that contact because it's, it's very easy for... I don't know, you know what it's like in academia, six months can go past and you realize you've not gone back to that that paper, that that grant or whatever that you haven't looked at in a while. So I think you know when you're if you're planning a, a grant, for example, it's maybe worth trying to find the balance between having too many unnecessary meetings and 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 not enough, you know, so that you can find that the balance of being able to stay in contact. So logistics, much less uh, romantic than friendship. I agree about the friendship too. Thanks, Richard. I think friendship is a really nice note to end on and to wrap up today's session. So can I um, you know, pass on a huge thanks um, to today's panel, Richard, Mia, Myrna and Katie. Um, it's been so interesting and um, 